The cape and cowl, probably the most iconic piece of Batman's wardrobe. It's what makes his silhouette instantly recognizable and strikes terror into the hearts of criminals everywhere. Despite its legendary status, I'd have never thought to make an entire episode centered on it. The cape and cowl conspiracy doesn't even focus on the notion of Batman's secret identity. It makes the physical cape and cowl the most important element in the story. That's not to say this episode doesn't have a consistent thematic motif. The cape and cowl represents Batman's mastery of disguise, which is a tool that can be used to actively catch criminals, not just to safeguard his identity. This is an important distinction because a story meant to focus on Batman's persona would probably use the Bruce Wayne persona to provide a contrast and a more interesting exploration of how Bruce views himself, very much like what was done in the last episode, Pretends to Dream. Here, however, Batman is tackling a case that can't be completely resolved with brute force and must use his intellectual skills to catch Wormwood, a criminal who uses death traps to obtain sensitive information from his targets. I say completely resolved because, of course, there is a fistfight at the end of the episode, but more on that later. Wormwood is commissioned by a con man who calls himself the Baron to get Batman's cape and cowl with the condition that he'll only tell Wormwood what he plans to do with them if Wormwood spills how he kept stolen bear bonds from the International Relief Consortium and to whom he will sell them. If one does not call the ending, the viewer is given an effective understanding of why Wormwood can let go of his curiosity towards the Baron's request. I mean, it's not like he has to know who Batman really is, he just wants some of Batman's clothing. It's an interesting commentary on how most people by nature, especially someone as intellectually arrogant as Wormwood, desire to get at the truth, in this case over something that is designed to cover someone's face and keep the truth from the public. The synergy between Batman and Wormwood is treated like a battle of wits on steroids, as they continually top each other until Batman plays his final hand and reveals that he has been in control the entire time. The scene before Wormwood and the Baron have their first meeting in which Batman interrogates the Baron works to subvert expectations so the viewer suspects that the reason the Baron wants the cowl is for revenge on Batman for humiliating him. The sequences in which Batman escapes Wormwood's death traps have a similar purpose in that Batman is making Wormwood believe that the battle between them is limited to the effectiveness of the death trap, when in reality Batman has been playing Wormwood by disguising himself as the Baron in the hopes of getting Wormwood to incriminate himself in regards to the bonds. Batman revealing this to Wormwood is strangely foreshadowed when Batman finally succumbs to the Wax Museum trap and gives up his cowl only to have another mask underneath. A disguise within a disguise, just like Batman disguising himself as the Baron. That being said, it is pretty funny when Batman does two exasperated growls after relinquishing his cowl and finding that Wormwood is gone. Maybe he was just trying to give Wormwood a false sense of security and dupe him into thinking he's won, but it's just kind of silly. The second mask does make Batman look more pissed off than usual now that I look at it. Anyways, it's also strange why Wormwood isn't suspicious as to why the Baron would want to know about the Bonds, and especially why he'd want to know who commissioned their theft. The only reason I can figure is that Wormwood was too caught up in his curiosity over the cowl request that he didn't bother to question the Baron's nosing around about past crimes, but this oversight slightly undercuts his intellect. My final complaint on the narrative level is that much of this intrigue is most effective on first viewing, so repeat viewings won't be frequent here. Many great mystery stories or stories that revolve around a big reveal usually have various moving parts that come together to form a cohesive whole. This episode is quite simple in comparison to more dense episodes this series has to offer, such as Second Chance, or even POV, but it's up to par as a standalone story. The Cape and Cowl Conspiracy deliberately plays with many of the more traditional elements of Batman's mythos. I never even realized until now that the Bat Signal has never been used before this episode because Gordon just set it up, and it looks pretty glorious. Obviously, the Death Traps are very much a throwback to Batman 66, and though Wormwood is a decent antagonist for this version of Batman, I get the feeling he'd be much more at home in that series. Even the rhyming riddles, the hologram girl on the train tracks, and Batman taunting the villain with a riddle of his own all call back to a simpler time in superheroics. It's also possible I've become accustomed to more modern and self-serious superhero fiction conventions, but these elements stood out to me in this episode more than any other in Batman the Animated Series. These touches give the sense that Bruce Timm and his team are conscious about all past popular eras in this character's rich history, and incorporate them into their version of Batman sort of a best of all possible worlds. This is why it's especially exciting that Batman the Animated Series has been followed by other animated and comic incarnations that take a similar approach and pull from various elements of the lore to create their own versions of the character. Since much of the fun this episode is watching Batman dealing with these complicated traps, it got me thinking about why this trope is a mainstay. 
It crops up multiple times within this very show, such as when Batman has to escape the vault in The Clock King, and when he secures himself in a safe in Riddler's Reform. It's important that Batman not only be a formidable physical presence, but also an intellectual one, so these death traps provide a great story opportunity to test Batman's ingenuity in a truly engaging context. This idea is the crux for why the Cape and Cow conspiracy is a worthy Batman story to tell, but at the end of the day I wouldn't deem it much higher than an average episode. The animation itself reflects my overall opinion of the episode. Most shots here look pretty solid, though the characters are a bit bulgy, and there's no fluidity of movement that particularly stands out. As I said before, the most memorable image would be Batman's bandana mask underneath his cowl. The action is suitably kinetic, and the environments, especially the Wax Museum, are effectively utilized. Despite Gordon not having a noteworthy role in apprehending Wormwood, Bob Hastings gets plenty of dialogue to display just how naturally he fits the role. I especially enjoy the understated humor he is able to inflect when Batman belittles Gordon by almost immediately figuring out that Wormwood's next trap will be at the Wax Museum. The guest star this time around is Bud Court as Josiah Wormwood. His higher-pitched, snivelly voice works quite well for a character that harkens back to a more old-fashioned type of villain, especially one like Wormwood who believes in his intellectual superiority over others. This is partly why I didn't find Batman's fistfight with Wormwood in the final act all that engaging. I could buy that he could match wits with Batman, but not necessarily that he could beat him mano a mano. This is not a problem with Bud's performance, just a general story issue. Bud can be counted among the DC Animated Universe's vast alumni because he was also the voice of Toy Man in Superman the Animated Series, and Justice League Unlimited. With that character, his higher pitch comes off as wonderfully demented and matches the equally demented character design. To sum up, the Cape and Cowell conspiracy has never been one of my favorites, but if you really dig the type of Batman story where he has to use his brains to figure out a deadly trap, then I'd understand why you'd enjoy it more than I did. Putting the traps aside, Batman also gets the opportunity to demonstrate his mastery of disguise and what a powerful tool it can be in crime fighting, as he will do so again in Batgirl's opening two-parter, Shadow of the Bat. Despite its simplicity, this episode definitely falls more in the good category, so I rated a lukewarm 3.5 out of 5. Once again, I have to thank my subscribers for keeping the count up, even when my output isn't as high as I would like. Since Christmas is this week, consider this my holiday gift to you guys. Hope you guys enjoyed it, and that you'll also come back for the next review. Next time, we get our first two-parter in the second box set, and boy is it a fan favorite. Join me as we explore Robin's backstory and characterization in a review for both episodes of Robin's Reckoning. See you then.